So um, we're going to talk a little bit this morning about trauma, specifically posterior segment trauma. Um, just a variety of findings, how to evaluate patients, um, management, etc. So we'll go through kind of the original assessment. So when, when you get called to evaluate a traumatized eye in the ER or wherever, I mean, it obviously depends on the nature of the trauma and what else is going on with the patient, but the history of well, what happened is can often clue you into what you're going to find or what you're likely to find, right? So, and it's good, and you, you need to have this stuff for documentation purposes, especially if it's potentially going to be a work-related or workman's comp thing. So good documentation about exactly when and how and where and the circumstances of the injury um, are important and whether it was work-related or not, safety glasses, et cetera. So that should always be documented. Uh, past doctor history, if you can get it, you know, have they had prior eye surgery and trocular lenses? That way you know if, you know, you've evaluated an eye and a lens is missing, um, whether you need to look for it in the eye or it's been extruded, et cetera. And then just the other kind of obvious things about their general medical history and that sort of thing. So. So here's where a history could have clued you in what you, you look in and an eye sees very poorly and you see this and um, you may not see much external trauma at all, but, but you know, the history might clue you in as to what this is. And so this was a person playing basketball and got a finger, you know, digit into the orbit um, and had rather abrupt loss of vision. And so you don't really see the nerve here, but this is an optic nerve avulsion. So, Again, not a lot on the physical exam until you look inside the eye, but the history about what was going on at the time will kind of clue you in as to what's likely there. Um, so in evaluating the patient, obviously it depends on the status of the patient and where you can evaluate them, but um, at least a, a quick initial assessment, of, you know, do we have an open or closed globe situation? How, how much of an exam can you do? Um, you always want to try to document at least some level of vision, obviously. Um, can they at least see light or near card vision, what they can see. If you can get them into the regular exam lane and do a more thorough exam, that's obviously preferred, but again, depends on the rest of the injuries. So your basic exam, slit lamp pressure, dilated fundus, and then imaging, you know, really depends on the nature of the injury. You know, do you suspect a form body? Um, do you have a poor view, uh, et cetera? So um, that just depends on what you can or can't see and the nature of the the injury so so obviously a quick assessment bedside assessment sometimes you can tell if an eyes open or closed just by a quick look um, other times it's you know maybe a little more subtle and you know like on sit lamp here there's not a lot of subconscious hemorrhage or things but you can see that there's a, a laceration in the sclera here in an open eye situation which may not be obvious unless you do a slit lamp exam on the patient so um, obviously, if you can, you know, it's always nice to do a dilated exam and, you know, again, you'll find things that, um, on a dilated exam that you may not suspect. Maybe it was a you know, fairly minor injury, but, um, you know, any of these histories of metal on metal, I just got called as an expert witness on a case of, um, well, it's not, it was somebody that went in, was hammering on a nail and went in to see an optometrist. They didn't do a dilated exam diagnosed the healed abrasion, put them on antibiotics and want them to come back in a couple of days and well, they never showed and went somewhere else. And they did a dilated exam and still didn't see a foreign body. Um, he finally went into an ER and had a CAT scan done because he was having pain and loss of vision and they found a intraocular foreign body that had been missed. Um, but the question there in the legal case was, should that patient have been sent for imaging? Um, you know, and that's what they're suing about, that the optometrist didn't, first one didn't even look in the back of the eye, and the second one did, but didn't find it. Um, so where's the liability there, if there is any? The patient ended up doing okay, so I don't think there's gonna be a liability, never got into optomitis, warm body got taken out, ended up with good vision, but there's still a lawsuit over the missed diagnosis of an intraocular form body. So um, I see that a fair amount, and um, from ER cases where they might treat a little abrasion or something, but anytime you have a history of something flying at the eye, hammering metal on metal, I mean, I think you have to assume there could be an intraocular form body until proven otherwise. You either have to get a really good look at everything intraocularly or image the eye if you can't see inside the eye. So we'll just go through some of the kind of the typical findings 
with trauma, both, and I'll break it down kind of into blunt trauma and the type of things you'll see in the eye with blunt trauma. And then we'll talk a little bit about penetrating, perforating injuries and intraocular foreign bodies, which are kind of a subset of that. So blunt trauma. Um, We'll start at the front of the eye and then we'll talk about mostly retinal things, but I mean, obviously these are some of the more common things you might see from a severe blunt injury. Um, you know, hyphema is a fairly common thing and angle damage, et cetera. So we're not gonna talk specifically about hyphema management. Um, I don't think it's changed too much over the years, except when I started, we were actually in, inpatient. For, for my residency, we admitted people you know, and put them in strict bed rest with hyphemas. Um, those days are gone, clearly, but I think the general management of hyphemas hasn't changed too much with pretty much inactivity, cycloplegia, steroids, and watching them carefully for rebleeds. So this is actually a picture of a patient who had a rebleed. You can see an original clot on the side and then some fresh blood layered. Um, not necessarily an acute thing with trauma, but angle recession, certainly, in patients that have had any significant hyphema, um, you know, gonioscopy is something that they need to have done at some point. Um, and they're always obviously at risk for glaucoma down the road. And then various iris injuries can occur. You can have a small little dialysis like this, which may or may not become a visual issue for a patient. Or you can have more significant iris trauma, which obviously is going to cause more visual issues for the patient, maybe probably will need surgical repair. Then you can start to get into more significant iris injuries or lens injuries too. You're starting to see some partial luxation of the lens here and a lot of iris atrophy and damage. And the various lens injuries, you can, you know, I will just talk about the human lens, crystalline lens, but you know, intraocular lenses can, can dislocate and do things too, even with, with blunt trauma. So here's a you know, partially luxated uh, lens. And then this is not very common to see, but this is a lens that's anteriorly dislocated into the anterior chamber from blunt injury. Has anybody ever seen this? Anterior subluxation? Neither have I actually, so. Um, pretty rare for it to go that way. But as you can imagine, this patient would have some issues and pressure, et cetera, and would need you know, surgery fairly promptly. Um, again, not as common as dislocation of the lenses, but you can have, the lens, the zonules may hold, but you may rupture the anterior capsule or posterior capsule from a blood injury. Again, not as common as dislocation of a lens, but this is a ruptured anterior capsule from a blunt injury. Um, and so you would manage this patient, if, you know, like any other FACO. And, um, This is kind of a typical picture, you know, you have somebody with a, with a blunt injury and you're like, well, first thing is, you know, is there a ruptured globe? Is there an occult ruptured globe? How do you know? Um, what's your level of suspicion? So this patient has, this eye shows a couple of findings that you would want to watch for. So there's, you can't really see the depth of the chamber, but you see this kind of elevated iris in the periphery in an overly deep chamber. So a lot of people think, well, you have a, you have a ruptured globe, it should be a shallow chamber, low pressure. Not necessarily. Uh, you can have a really deep looking chamber and the pressure may be perfectly normal. I think this kind of bowed up iris. And then there's hemorrhagic chemosis on the side. So you see subconscious hemorrhage, you see a funny deep chamber. Um, doesn't matter what their pressure is. I mean, I think no one's going to fault you for ruling out a rupture and taking them and exploring a globe like this in the OR. And where would the ruptures most likely be in a case like this? But what whereabouts? Where where's so okay? We're rupture globes from blunt trauma. Where where are they typically rupture? What would be the most common sites? Limbus, limbus, especially if had prior surgery of any kind. You know, cat, prior cataract wounds, especially PK wounds. Obviously, those are more susceptible to rupturing than anywhere else. But let's assume they've never had prior surgery on their eye. Yeah, behind the muscle insertions is often where there will be ruptures. So you might might have to explore or take off a muscle or at least look behind the muscles very carefully. So, um, so moving back in the eye, some of the more common posterior things you would see from blunt injury, obviously hemorrhage would probably be one of the more common. So you got blood in the vitreous. 
Um, and that could be from a number of different things. Um, so it just shows a poor view. You know, you might see retinal disruption and things, and we'll talk about some of these findings in a minute. But more commonly, um, vitreous hemorrhage is probably not due. We always think about a torn retina when you have blood in the vitreous, and you should. But that's probably not the where the most common source of blood is in, in the posterior segment. More likely, it's injury from the anterior structures, iris, ciliary body, or it could be from choroidal rupture and things. But uh, from a tear per se, it's not, not one of the more common reasons, in a, at least acutely, that you would see a hemorrhage. Um, so what do we do with hemorrhage as well? You know, assuming everything else is okay, we usually follow them, ultrasound, ophthalmoscopy. But if they're not clearing, um, and there's anything suspicious starting to show up on ultrasound, then we do early vitrectomies. We wouldn't hold off, off on a traumatic vitreous hemorrhage where we couldn't visualize the retina. Kamosho, uh, again, or Berlin's edema is another old term for it, but um, pretty common in blunt injuries. You'll see this a lot. This is kind of this whitened appearance of parts of the retina. It can be peripheral, it can be macular, or pretty severe like this. You may see hemorrhage associated with it. Um, most of the cases of commotion, unless they're really severe and have a lot of hemorrhages, end up resolving with pretty good vision and usually not much uh, residual visual effect, although again, it depends on the nature of the injury and how extreme it is. But they can be left behind with a lot of pigmentary changes and loss of vision too. So um, so what is commotion? You know, we always talk you now with OCT, we can image the retina. We don't typically get OCTs on acute commotion, but you can. Um, and you do see thickened retina. You do see outer retinal disruption and thickening. And there is some edema. We used to classically teach that it wasn't really due to edema at all. It was just the whitening was just due to photoreceptor disruption and outer segments of disruption that caused a whitened appearance to the retina. But <clears throat> I think any of us that have seen enough of it looked, is it looks swollen too. It doesn't just look white in a lot of areas. It looks swollen, and it is. So there is some edema there, um, but there's also a lot of disruption in the outer segments of the retina too. Fortunately, most commotion resolves with good vision, um, but not, not always, so. And they can acutely, especially if they have a lot of macular commotion, have quite poor vision. Some people will put people on steroids for bad commotion. Um, I don't, know that I've ever seen any evidence that it really does much, but if you have somebody who's down to finger counting vision, has a lot of edema, commotio, you could consider putting them on a burst of steroids for that. I, I typically don't. Um, choroidal rupture is, again, a pretty common thing to see in the retina from blunt injury. Um, they may be kind of small, like this little one off to the nasal side here. It could be peripapillary. This is kind of a, a picture of an old one. It's left very papillary atrophy. But more typically, they'll have this kind of concentric appearance. I guess they may be multiple. Um, they're often associated with subretinal hemorrhage, too. And in fact, a lot of times when you see subretinal hemorrhage from an injury underneath that, you may not see it initially, but underneath that, there's often a choroidal rupture as the blood resolves. You'll see a choroidal rupture as the source of the hemorrhage. Again, these. Uh, depending on where the rupture is, patients may see just fine. Um, if the choroidal rupture obviously goes through the central macular region, they're going to have poor vision. Um, and then there's the late sequelae of these, which we all know about. Um, we'll talk about that in a minute. So when you have AP compression, you get horizontal stretching, and that causes this um, tearing of the Brooks membrane complex. Uh, and that's why they have this concentric pattern to the disc. And then the last little bullet point here is these patients, like any other patient that has something that's disrupted their RPE Brooks membrane, they're at risk for ingrowth or neovascularization developing within these ruptures, just like lacquer cracks and myopes or, or anything that disrupts the RPE. Typically, these won't show up immediately. They're the kind of months later, three to six months later, or even beyond that. But it's something you have to caution patients about, tell them what to watch for as far as metamorphopsia. You can give an amsler grid if you want, but, and then watch them fairly carefully over the, at least especially the first six months. But even beyond that, they always need to know that they're sort of at risk for, for this happening. Um, 
this is just a patient that had subretinal hemorrhage, and as it's clearing, you can see underlying choroidal rupture. This is the patient that developed coronary vascularization and has fibrosis now. Um, that's blood actually from a coronary vascularization and a choroidal rupture. These used to be treated with laser. I and mean, you can still do that, actually. I mean, if you have coronary vascularization that's eccentric, you know, maybe on the far edge, not anywhere near the macula, you can still treat that um, with thermal laser. We probably would treat it with anti-VEGF because that's just the way we treat everything nowadays. But, but there's no reason you couldn't uh, if it was not, you know, central or you'd think the laser scar was going to. And they do, they do well for that. But they're always at risk for recurrences, and you've got to caution them about that, so. Macular holes, um, you know, we always think of macular holes as typical idiopathic, age-related type macular holes related to, you know, vitreal retinal interface issues. Um, but they can occur after trauma. And initially, you know, when macular hole surgery was um, first developed in the early 90s, you know, the, the thought about, on, you know, when we had some success in closing macular holes, then it says, well, what about these traumatic holes? And, at that time, you know, again, this is pre-OCT imaging and understanding, everybody thought that traumatic macular holes were probably due to a contusion necrosis, that this tissue was gone, you know. And so we didn't think that surgery would probably help traumatic macular holes. But you can. You can close traumatic macular holes, uh, probably not quite as easily as, as the adult variety, but... Um, you know, they also have vitreo macular interface issues, and they're often limited visually by this other stuff going on, choroidal ruptures, underlying macular disruption. But um, <clears throat> the other thing about traumatic holes, and I, I, I often they're in young pe people, you know, so you get somebody that comes in, it's a kid or a teenager or whatever, and they've had some injury and they have a traumatic macular hole. Um, I usually sit on these for a while because I've had a number of these closed spontaneously. So once they start releasing, you know, their highlight starts to come off, some of these will just, you know, shut down and close down. So um, so I would typically, if somebody comes in, they have a traumatic macular hole, would watch them for, you know, months, six weeks, maybe even longer. If they're not closing at that point, then you would offer them vitrectomy and gas and face down positioning. Again, how well they do. They're a little harder to close just because it's a little harder to get all the vitreous off some of these younger eyes and positioning sometimes may be an issue. But um, the, the success rating of macular hole closure traumatic holes is not as high. Can't give you a number, but it's probably at least 80%. Again, it depends on the size of the hole, the under, other underlying things, but you can certainly close traumatic macular holes too. Retinitis scloperteria. This is a um, condition of contusion injury to the retina and choroid. The original description is that it was, a, it was an orbital foreign body, not necessarily any trauma directly to the globe, sort of like uh, shock waves as something passed through the orbit. But the reality is it probably is something that hits the eye or hits the sclera. And it looks a lot like this, and you get this large uh, chorio-retinal ruptures uh, with extensive hemorrhage and it leads to pretty extensive scarring. This is kind of the late sequelae. You'll see bare sclera and scarring. But really anything that enters the orbit, pellets, BB guns, um, and you see this kind of uh, chorio-retinal disruption um, this falls under the title of retinitis scopoteria. They don't typically detach, at least not early on, because there's so much disruption and scarring. It's kind of like they've cryoed themselves. You know, this stuff sort of scars down. And unless they really start to get PVR and organized vitreous in the blood that can start to pull later on, then they can start to detach. But, um, but it's not something you'll typically see. And you'll often see these big ragged tears and all this blood and disruption. You'll think you need to cry or try to laser it, but you typically don't. This stuff will scar down. You just have to watch them pretty carefully. Um, certainly seen similar injuries like in paintballs hitting the eye and disruption. Anything, like I said, the, the classic description of this is something that goes into the orbit, not to the eye itself, but 
really anything that probably hits the eye acutely like that, like it used to be racquetballs, paintballs, whatever, can cause us massive chorioretinal disruption. So. So traumatic tears, dialysis, detachment. So, you know, the most common or the classic traumatic tear is a retinal dialysis, which we'll mention in a second. But you can get these ragged kind of tears, again, often in areas of disrupted chorioretinal um, scarring. Uh, and you don't typically see these um, lead to scarring. So here's a patient with a lot of commotio and hemorrhage and down in the lower left corner you can see this large kind of ragged tear so again most of us would want to try to treat this but you probably don't need to this stuff will tend to scar down but you have to watch out for vitreous traction organization of the vitreous in these but a lot of these will not detach and you can watch them pretty carefully um, it's hard to get treatment in a white retina like that too so trying to laser around this stuff is not easy to do you can cryo it um, but I usually would watch this carefully and, and just over the over a few weeks and see if it would scar down. Um, the other more typical type tears, retinal dialyses, these can be multiple, but typically they're infratemporal or supranasal. That's the classic location for a traumatic retinal dialysis. Uh, and these do need to be repaired as they do tend to progress on the detachments. Sometimes it's hard to see these because we'll see an acute patient, you know, they have a little hyphema, they've had blunt trauma. We don't want to do scleral depression acutely because they have a hyphema, etc. So you do the best peripheral exam you can, but then once they, once their um, anterior segment or whatever their hyphema is stabilized, they really need to have a careful depressed exam to look for a dialysis. They may not detach right away. You may see a peripheral dialysis and, and, um, no detachment, but they, they will detach, you know, fairly commonly if they're not repaired. So again, just diagrammatically shows where your more typical detachments are, or I'm sorry, where the dialyses are. And I showed this picture early on, um, optic nerve avulsion. Again, this is often due to, you'll see this kind of extreme hemorrhagic whitening of the retina, vascular abnormalities. Um, and this is often due to some type of like a digit or a blunt instrument that goes into the orbit and um, doesn't really shear the nerve off of the globe, obviously, but it causes stretching and rupture of the nerve fibers. And you'll see these hemorrhages over the nerve, venous stasis and farts. And the visual prognosis for these is terrible. And they often end up looking kind of like this. Um, this scarred uh, atrophy over the nerve and LP to NLP vision. You all seen optic nerve revulsions? Anybody seen any of these? Yeah, not very common either. So, but these can often look externally like very little, you know, very little has happened, but they're extremely poor vision. And the, the picture acutely is pretty classic. So, all right, so we'll talk a little bit about penetrating and perforating injuries. So I know you all get to see a reasonable number of these um, here. Not maybe not as many other Jim Bell has left, but so initially, you know, obviously our goals are to close the globe um, and up the Midas prophylaxis. And then I guess the controversy in this is who needs a vitrectomy and when and how do you manage, you, you close the globe, and, and then what do you do after that? Um, so, you know, here's a scleral laceration outside the point. So this just shows you want to expose it and get a nice closure, make a nice watertight eye. Um, and then what do you do? Well, and here's where I've seen a lot of, a lot of problems, too, is, you know, the standard is that if patients have any significant blood in their vitreous or if they've had any kind of vitreous loss that they probably need a secondary vitrectomy and usually the timing is kind of the other controversy how soon do you go in on something like this generally 10 to 14 days is kind of the main gun there's some early vitrectomy people now that depends on what you're seeing on ultrasound if you suspect a retinal detachment early you may not want to wait 10 days but the reason we wait um, is from a surgical standpoint, it makes things technically easier. Often there's corneal edema, poor view, 
I, the vitreous hasn't detached, so technically surgery can be much more difficult early on. There might be choroidals, choroidal swelling. So if you can wait 10 to 14 days, that's probably optimal timing to get things cleared out before organization and fibrosis and contraction of the vitreous develops. And again, I've seen patients that have been followed elsewhere. They've had a ruptured globe repair, they've had blood, and their doctor's waiting for them to clear, doing ultrasounds, and finally they say, I think you might be getting a detachment. Sit down, when was your injury? It was eight weeks ago. And they've had blood in their eye, you know, this whole time, and now they've got this organized stuff and fibrosis going on. So that's a problem. I mean, the standard, if that patient does poorly, you know, in theory, there's a medical legal issue there. Why wasn't I referred earlier? Standard of care is vitrectomy within two weeks and non-clearing hemorrhages after a traumatized eye. And it is, so you would have a hard time defending a bad outcome in that if you were just managing or following the patient. So bottom line is if you have anybody with a ruptured globe, it's repaired, if they've got, unless you can just see the entire retina fine and it's a nice clear view, get them into a retina specialist to have it evaluated and they'll determine whether or not a second vitrectomy is needed or not. But most eyes, if they have any residual blood, any loss of vitreous, it should have a vitrectomy. So I show this as it shows placing a band <clears throat> around the eye. Um, you know, when I trained originally, when we went in and did vitrectomies on ruptured globes, um, post-ruptured globes, we would circle everybody. I mean, we would just put a, a band and circle the vitreous base, um, you know, for RD prophylaxis. Probably don't do that that much anymore. But it's not a bad thing. I mean, because that the, the problem they get into obviously is if they do have a tear in their retina or detached retina and they have a lot of blood, it's trauma, they're a real PVR risk. These are eyes that tend to organize and, and not do well necessarily. So um, but again, a lot of times these are eyes that have had a rupture through a muscle or you know, and putting a band around them in a you know freshly closed globe is not the easiest thing in the world. So we'll often not do this. Um, but it's still done fairly commonly. Um, we talked about this a little bit, timing of these vitrectomies. So the reason to delay is for making surgical success rate a little easier, uh, technically easier, safer to do. So the controversy here comes in, like I mentioned earlier, you have a patient that had a ruptured globe, you do an ultrasound on day one or two, and it looks like maybe they have a detachment. And it's only the first or second day, a lot of blood in their eye. So what do you do? I mean, you want to sit on a detachment for 10 days. Well, probably, you know, I would probably still wait maybe a little minimum of a week um, on these, unless I thought it was going to be a pretty easy, maybe it was an older patient already had a PVD, cornea is pretty clear, you can probably go in earlier, but generally these are younger patients um, that are in trauma, they may have some corneal edema or be getting not the greatest view and you want to kind of let them stabilize, you know, for uh, a week to 10 days minimum, so. But this is controversial. There's other schools of thought on this, but most vitreoretinal people would say this is the proper timing for intervening. Um, intraocular foreign body. So these are managed a little differently than, than your typical open globes. Um, foreign bodies should be removed you know, as soon as is reasonably possible. And I say that because you don't necessarily have to remove a foreign body at one in the morning or two in the morning. Um, especially if it's a watertight eye. Uh, you can certainly probably wait, put them on antibiotics, shield them, and, and do it the next day. That's not a problem. If you have an open eye that obviously needs to be closed and you have a foreign body in the eye, there the question comes up, okay, do you do both simultaneously? Do you do a vitrectomy and get the foreign body out and close the globe or just close the globe? And I think it really depends on what your view's like. I mean, to, to do an acute vitrectomy sometimes is very difficult depending on the view and what let's say it's a corneal lack and you may have a hard time doing a safe vitrectomy to get the foreign body out so at the very least you want to close the globe and do antibiotic prophylaxis and then delaying the foreign body removal even several days or a week isn't necessarily a bad thing as long as they're not developing endophthalmitis you have to watch them pretty carefully for that long term obviously there are problems with retained foreign bodies which we'll mention so 
but it, acutely, you know, with delaying the removal of the foreign body isn't necessarily something that depends on the nature of the foreign body too, but most of these are metal, metallic. Um, they're often sterile because of the high velocity of the friction. Um, external magnetic extraction, we're nobody, we don't even think we have this old magnet here anymore, but in the old days it was this external magnet called a Bronson magnet, so you could do a, I have some pictures of it here, you could externally remove it through the sclera, especially if it was a deep foreign body, make a little cut down the sclera and use this external magnet, it would pull it out through the sclera. Um, but most of the time, they're removed with the parse plane of vitrectomy, either with magnet or forceps removal. So again, you can see there's a little corneal rupture here, some corneal edema, high suspicion that there may be a foreign body in the eye. Foreign bodies can be anywhere, right? They can be in the anterior chamber, they can be in the lens, or more commonly, they go through and they're either in the vitreous or in the retina. Now, when you see something like this, you can see a edge of a metallic foreign body here, see some blood and some whitening around it. What you don't know looking at this picture is how big is this foreign body and, and is this the tip of the iceberg? And there's a lot of it external because if you have something that's, you know, 80% of that is passed through the sclera and this is just the tip and you try to pull it through into the vitreous cavity, you may create more harm. You may get a lot of choroidal bleeding or you may, you may um, lengthen or enlarge the tear in the retina. So it helps to have an idea how big this piece of foreign body is. And sometimes you can't tell. So imaging will sometimes help you. Um, you know, you look in the eye. But So this just shows a um, localizing. This is a where we used to take, well, we, this is before my time mostly, but using an external magnet. So what he's doing is localizing on the sclera by depressing and marking where the foreign body is. Uh, you do this little scleral cut down, overlying it, and then this shows, it's kind of hard to see, but the magnet has this long probe, so it's, it's about, you know, it's like this big and has a probe, a little sharp tip probe on it that's a high magnet, and it will pull it out externally. So that just shows the little cavity in the sclera where it was removed. So it's not a great image. This is just meant to show how a lot of the foreign body, this is an intrascleral foreign body, and you might see the tip of this in the retina, but most of it is intrascleral external. And so some of these may be easier to remove externally than internally. And then if you're lucky, you just get some scarring and everything stays in place. But more typically, you'll see a foreign body like this, maybe sitting in the vitreous, sitting on the surface of the retina. And we approach these with a pars plane approach um, and remove them. So. Eyes like this often, you know, as opposed to a lot of other penetrating or perforating injuries, um, neutrogger form bodies can do quite well. It really depends on obviously where it hits, you know, if it, if it lands in the macula or hits the nerve or does something, then they may not do well. But a lot of these are clean little penetrations. If they don't get an infection, um, get the form body out. And many of these eyes end up being 20 20. It really depends on where it went through and what damage it did. When you remove these through the sclera, now some of these are magnetic, some aren't. It depends on what the metal is. So when I do these, if it's sitting right on the retina, you know, they have, we have four body forceps that have pretty wide jaws that can grasp it and pull it. But anytime you grasp on that form body, you're creating some pressure. So if it's sitting on the retina, you really don't want to do that ideally because you're going to create some downward pressure and push in. So it's a lot easier to lift these things with the little rare earth magnet, which is a little 20 gauge magnet. Um, and then you can lift them up into the vitreous. And what I usually do is, you, this is the hardest part is getting it out through the sclera. So you've got it, you've got the foreign body either in your, force, in your forceps or on the magnet, and then want to get it out through the sclera. And you have to make sure you've enlarged your sclerotomy through your parse plane wide enough so it's not going to fall off as you pull it through the sclera. And that doesn't usually happen with the forceps because you've got a good grip on it. But if you try to pull it out with the magnet, it'll often knock it off the magnet, and then it's kind of stuck up in the pars plane of somewhere and harder to find. So I usually try to transfer it. I'll get it off the retina with a magnet, use the form body forceps, and, and grasp it off the magnet with that, and then pull that, pull it out through the sclerotomy with the forceps. I find that the easiest way to get these out. So this is a patient with a little bit of retained metal. And so why do we need to get these out other than the fact that they don't belong there and they can cause infections, et cetera? You know, the infection rate with these isn't that high, 
it's probably five. Well, my slide will show you about post foreign body infections, but but metal in the eye, um, long term, depending on what the metal is, can cause these other issues. And um, we don't typically see a lot of calcosis, either acute or chronic, but you can certainly see cirrhosis and iron foreign bodies that are retained. And um, so calcosis is a copper toxicity, typically has these findings. Um, to see decimate changes, this iris discoloration, cataracts, and then these little kind of metal flakes. It's almost like uh, shiny crystalline flecks that'll develop along the vessels. I don't think I have really a good picture of that, but it just kind of shows the cataract. And this is, I think it was supposed to show corneal changes, but I can't see it, so. Siderosis uh, is probably something you'll see when we have cases walk in. Um, certainly, I've had a few cases of this myself. So, um, typical findings: this iris heterochromia. You'll see this rust staining, um, but this the cataract changes. But the the pigmentary retinopathy, loss of ERG. That's kind of the classic um, teaching and or the classic findings of this. And this is kind of a typical thing. This is an encapsulated old metallic foreign body in the inferior retina that was never removed or never found or didn't know about it, you can start to see the pigmentary changes developing around this. And they'll end up, you know, they can end up in late stages like an RP, retinitis pigmentosa, with extensive pigmentary retinopathy and loss of their ERG, which is just shows poor ERG findings. So endoptomitis, we talked about with trauma. Um, Foreign body, I mean, the, the difference in this and, and you know, post-surgical endoptomitis is probably the incidence of bacillus as one of the agents that we will see. And it's reported as up to 25% of cases of endoptomitis and post-trauma or post foreign body will be bacillus. So clindamycin, consider using. I say avoid intravitreal prophylactic injections. Um, you know, I don't know. Y'all, when you're closing ruptured globes or open eyes, do you give anything intravitreal or subconscious, or do you just put them on IV or give an IV or give them system? Subconscious, yeah. And I think that's smart. I mean, I know people that were injecting into the vitreous. I'm like, well, you don't, a lot of these, you don't really know where you're injecting, you know, because you don't have a good view. You may be injecting into a choroidal hemorrhage. You don't know where this is going necessarily. So I don't recommend injecting intravitreally acutely. Unless they have endoptomitis, but I mean, just on a prophylactic basis, no. Um, same thing with cryopex. I didn't mention that, but there are a lot of people for a while, you know, when they would close a, a ruptured eye, but we're back, you know, say it's back five, six, seven millimeters, the extension of it, when well, you know that's going over where retina is. And so um, once it's closed, you know, people that will put cryo spots all along that area posteriorly because they presume that there was a retinal break there too. I think that just incites more inflammatory reaction and probably creates more issues. And it's kind of blind to cryo, so uh, I don't recommend doing that either. So I think just good closure, antibiotic prophylaxis. Don't don't cryo the wound. I don't think anybody here does that, dude. But for a while, there were a lot of people doing that, recommending that. So. Um, so we have to mention SO. Has anybody seen an active case of SO? Mm -hmm. Vitaly follows a few patients. You have, Bruce? Not acutely, just the Yeah, long-term long -term follow-up, yeah. So I've seen two cases, I mean, developed that I've followed that developed SO um, over the years. So it's not, obviously not common, but approximately one in 500 penetrating injuries will get SO. Um, that's the just statistic you need to know. Um, and again, it can be any time from as soon as three months to a long time later. And you know, the classic teaching is, well, if you have a blind, non-viable eye, it should be enucleated within two weeks. Um, reality is that rarely happens. You know, we, we close eyes, they usually have LP or a little vision, you know, and then we plan secondary, um, secondary surgeries to try to salvage vision. But um, if you have, clearly have an eye that's, that's uh, clearly no light perception, you at least have to have this discussion with the family. They need to be aware of this. You need to have had a discussion with them that it's a rare condition, but here's what the general guidelines are. 
Because um, if you don't have that discussion and something bad happens, you know, you're setting yourself up for a problem too. So. This isn't really part of our talk, but it is poster segment trauma, right? You guys see too much of this, I know, um, with shaken baby and these multiple hemorrhages, and so we won't really. Um, I just throw this up here. Whiplash. Um, well, in the pre-OCT days, this was kind of a presumed diagnosis. You'd see this, what looked like this small little defect or round little defect in the outer retina on biomicroscopy. But now with, um, with OCTs, you can actually see these. It does look a lot like solar maculopathy. It's this kind of linear um, outer retinal defect. Um, kind of looks like a, what you can sometimes see with vitreo macular traction, a little outer retinal defect or a post macular hole that's closed, but you still have this little outer retinal little defect, often a little linear thing. That's what whiplash will look like. So, um, but they usually do pretty, pretty well. <clears throat> 